Uh, he liked that, that sort of sharp um, getting at the politician. That, that amused him and he would like to have done it. But the authors um, overruled. Thank you, Minister. Uh, well, it was nothing. I thought of Nigel for Sir Humphrey, and Johnny thought of Derek Felds as Bernard, but it was John Howard Davis who'd worked with Paul on The Good Life who decided that Paul was ideal, and I hadn't seen it that way, but once he said Paul, I thought, yeah, yeah, that would work. But you got me this job, you said. Yes, but I didn't expect you to do anything. <laughs> I mean, you've never done anything before. <laughs> Humphrey started off by getting the upper hand, but uh, we began to see that it would get too predictable. Uh, this is a private meeting, Humphrey. Ah, uh, do you want me to shut the door? Yes, please. Uh, no, Humphrey. <laughs> From the other side. Quite often it was a sort of draw, in uh, that, the, you know, Jim wanted something terribly badly, like a cook to do lunches at 10 Downing Street. A cook? Seconded from the cabinet office canteen. But to cook lunch for me here at the flat. Something that none of your predecessors ever accomplished. <laughs> He'd trade that in for something Humphrey wanted really badly. And Trident. Oh, uh, leave Trident off the cabinet agenda for the time being. That is my firm decision. All right? Yes, Prime Minister. There's always a moment in every episode of Yes, Minister when. You know, he starts thinking that, you know, some crazy scheme that Sir Humphrey has suggested to him, you know, is going to be, might be a good idea, and then, hang on a minute, it's a brilliant idea, and then he goes from being a kind of puzzled, small-time minister into being Napoleon. <laughs> In the space of about 20 seconds, you see his expressions change, the clouds pass across his face, and by the time he's finished with it, he is, he's Churchill. And then you would hear those sounds. It falls to one man. <laughs> Lead his people out of the valley of the shadow and into the sunlit uplands of peace and prosperity. <laughs> He's a frustrated actor, Jim Hacker. <laughs> yes, I suppose we have got rather fond of one another, <laughs> in a way. In a way, yes. <laughs> <laughs> like a terrorist and his hostage. <laughs> Which one of you is the terrorist? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like all good comedy um, partnerships. It, it, it's marital. Paul was extremely generous, and so was Nigel, because they, they would have ten-minute scenes, and I was, used to be sitting at the table listening to this barrage of argument, and then at the end I would have one line, which was extremely funny. Shall we now continue with the agendum? Agendum? Oh, yes. We have no agendum. We have no agendum today. <laughs> No, on the other occasion, he would say, um, you're very lucky, aren't you, really, Derek? I said, well, standing, you know, between us, it's rather like a master class every Sunday, isn't it? <laughs> Humphrey, I've been thinking. Good. <laughs> the viewer had to believe that this man could be a government minister, could be a prime minister, indeed. Although people laughed at it, they kind of believed in it, too. What if the press should get hold of this, eh? <laughs> They'd have to have another leak inquiry. <laughs> they won't really set up an inquiry, will they? Oh, bound to. But won't that be uh, embarrassing? No, 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 no. <laughs> That's what leak inquiries are for. <laughs> Setting up. They don't actually conduct them. So Paul had this extra hard job of, of both being a comedy figure, almost a buffoon, and yet at the same time being a credible person to be a cabinet minister, and he did that beautifully. Well, Prime Minister, you place me in a very difficult position. Do I, Humphrey? Now, look, I realise you have to have loyalty to your colleagues, but you also have a broader loyalty to cabinet and its policy. I agree. You agree? <laughs> yes. You agree with me? I agree with you. <laughs> ah, I, I, don't, I don't quite... Who do you agree with? With you. <laughs> we did get drawn into the political field, and Margaret Thatcher, it was really her liking of the series which elevated it to uh, um, the success that it became. Thatcher found it very interesting and amusing, I think. Uh, she accepted that Nigel Hawthorne was the perfect civil servant. She did not accept that Paul could ever be prime minister. And I think behind that was a, a knowledge that Paul was towards the left and a pacifist and a Quaker, 
and was quite vocal about it. He was never um, worried about putting his head over the parapet and saying things against that particular Conservative government. So uh, that wouldn't have gone down well at all with Thatcher, and as a result, she was very clever, I think. She gave them, she gave them CVEs, as if, you know, it didn't affect her at all. <laughs> the nominations in the category Light Entertainment Performance are Paul Eddington, Yes Minister, Nigel Hawthorne, Yes Minister. I do think he was a, a little sad over the fact that Paul and Nigel were always nominated for the best actor uh, in, te in a television, um, and he never got it. Forgive me, Minister. <laughs> <laughs> so why do you think Nigel keeps winning all the BAFTAs and I don't get one? I said, because he's got longer speeches than you. <laughs> However, he found recognition in other ways. Remember his telling me that he'd gone over to Australia once and Bob Hawke met him at a function, and Bob Hawke said to Paul, would you like to come along to one of the rallies? And Paul said, yeah, I'd love to. You know, because he loved political stuff. He was very politically orientated. So he um, got in the car and they buzzed off. And, and he said, suddenly I was in this arena with something like 60,000 people. And Bob Hawke said, you don't want to listen to me. This is the real prime minister. And Paul said he was thrown onto the stage and forced to improvise. People expected him to, to make remarks about current policy. I mean, quite, quite uh, uh, seriously, which, of course, he never did. He always made a joke of it. it it's, a, it's a very good question, and it's... Uh... <laughs> no, no, seriously, it's a... <laughs> it's a question that, as I've, I've, I've said on previous occasions, is a, in a democracy is the sort of question that ought to be asked. And... <laughs> He really did think he was something to do with the government, as well as a well-known actor, because he loved that. He reveled in, in the sort of rather grand <laughs> thing of being fated as a, a VIP rather than just a lovey. <laughs> After suffering with bad health for many years, he was diagnosed with a rare form of skin cancer in 1987. He handled his illness with incredible dignity in that he didn't say look at me poor me and make a fuss about it and he knew for years he was ill but he absolutely I mean we very few people knew until later and then he just said well I'm ill and that's it and he was not sorry for himself at all but he didn't camouflage it or make a big tara about it but that was very much his life he was never defeated but he was dashed at first at each thing. And then he used to say, well, it could be worse. Um, I can deal with that. I can deal with it. It was an acceptance. And his, uh, his life was an acceptance, really, of one thing after another. Uh, as the next, the next thing happened, he would just swallow hard and say, no, I can, I can, I can bear that. I can bear it. You would never, ever have known if you didn't know him, that he was ill. And he was very, very ill. Despite his increasing health worries, he decided to reunite with Richard Briers in David Storey's play, Home. He said, you'd love to do this with me. And I think because uh, we were very fond of each other and he knew his time was limited, it would be nice to do a play, maybe his last, and it was his last, with a friend rather than just another actor. So he did it, but made the terrible error when we toured Home of forgetting that we were in a sad play, but to the public, we were still a sort of geriatric Tom and Jerry. The result was I was getting letters all the time. They didn't write to him because I think they still thought he was a prime minister or something. But they wrote to me as a sort of chum, saying, why are you doing this dreary, dreadful, depressing play? How could you? Because they came for a laugh. And we forgot 25 years on that, 20 years on, that we were Tom and Jerry still and would be forever. A friend of mine, actually more of an acquaintance, really, was introduced to George VI at Waterloo. Waterloo. We didn't want him to appear in the newspapers too much, looking like that, and it was getting worse. It became public before we were ready for it to become public. I rang them at that time, and they had these people outside, and I said, you know, you're going to have to open that door and interview them and tell them. You know, you really have to tell them. And that's when the first pictures of him went out, so that people could actually see that he was ill. I mean, the fact that being an actor, it had to hit his face, I found very hard to take. I think when he did face-to-face, -to, -face, to 
towards the end, I thought there was a great act of bravery. Extraordinary control. I mean, talk about British stiff up lip. He really had that. Paul Eddington, you're one of our best and best loved actors. And I found it very hard and I found it very poor. He was there saying, what do you want, you know, if you're going to ask me to do this, I'm very pleased to tell you and this is what, this is me and this is how I am. And he wasn't sentimental in the slightest little bit and he wasn't being brave either. People are kind enough to say how brave and all the rest of it. I'm not brave at all. I, I do wish very sincerely that I hadn't got this problem. But as I have it, there's no alternative but just to say, yes, I've got it. His faith was the main thing which supported him. I don't think he could have got through it the way he did without it. Uh, we all did what we could. We, we all rallied. Um, we tried hard, but basically it was his own acceptance of the fact that he was not going to get better and he had better prepare to die. The actor Paul Eddington has died at the age of 68 from a rare form of skin cancer. The real, real sadness about, about his illness was that it robbed us of 10 years of great performances. I have been very lucky to have quite a few meaningful in that they are very special relationships that I've worked with in, in, in my working life. And his is certainly up there in the top, way up there. I remember him with great affection and great respect. He made me laugh. He made me laugh a lot. Well, he was a great personal friend. He was godfather to one of my children. I loved him. I thought he was a smashing man, and I wish there were more of his kind about. He was a great, great friend of mine, and uh, at, at the moment, Trish had become great friends of ours, so it's nice it continues on. A journalist once asked me what I would like my epitaph to be, and I said, I think I would like it to be, he did very little harm. And that's not easy. Uh, most people seem to me to do a great deal of harm. If I could be remembered as having done very little, that would suit me.